I mean, I left the Paras, joined the SAS. I was one of the youngest to join at the time. American Army logistics team took a wrong turn, drove into Al Nazaria. They allowed me onto the sort of plinth to see this fallen statue of Saddam. Very famous statue at the time. And then from the distance, I saw this old boy in the middle of the road with the head. Quite exciting time of being sniped at, trying to bargain for this, the head of Saddam in the middle of Baghdad. Spud, how are you, brother? Pretty good, Chris, pretty good. Great to um, chat again, mate. Yeah, I, I heard the Goose Green uh, podcast went really well. Yeah, so for our friends at home, Nigel Spud Ely was a uh, former parachute regiment, joined the SAS um, during Spud's time in the Paras. He took part in the infamous, or do we call it legendary, Battle of Goose Green. And um, the podcast that we did was just went through the roof. I think it's been one of our most popular so far and uh, so it should be you know in in memory to those guys that uh, went down there and fought and also to to those that came back injured or didn't come back at all and today we're going to be talking about the next uh, phase of your life but aren't we in your adventures and uh, bring me the arse of Saddam do you want to tell us yeah. a bit about that Bring me the arse of Saddam, yeah. Basically, um, you, you're right, Chris, uh, we shouldn't forget the uh, those that were very badly wounded in Goose Green and during the Falklands War, of course, the 255 lost souls mm. through all, all arms. And uh, we just shouldn't forget them. Um, and, uh, yeah, I've got a book coming out March next year called Goose Green Uncensored Voices. And it took me three years to put together I basically travelled up and down this great nation of ours, interviewing the guys that were there and civilians and the Merchant Navy at Navy Air Force. Uh, the guys that weren't there at the front, at the, the guys that helped us win the battle. So that's kind of that's that's an exciting project that's uh, been reviewed at Frankfurt Book Show this week. So I'm really excited about that. But yeah, I mean, I left the Paras, joined the SAS. I was one of the youngest to join at the time. Uh, I, I left the, the SAS, then went on to uh, do military contracting, which they now call um, the business in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, we used to call it bodyguarding, but now they call it CP, don't they? Um, I then became a war correspondent. I covered a bit of Afghan and um, basically I wanted to cover the invasion or liberation of Iraq, depending on what side of the political fence you sit at. Um, I, I had all my accreditations from the NUJ, National Union of Journalists, and I had contacts in Kuwait. So the idea was, was for me to basically base myself in Kuwait until such times that Blair and Bush gave the order to invade. Um, that tells you where I come from. <laughs> and uh, so I, I sat up there, but by, by a twist of fate, I bumped into an old mate of mine while back on leave in Hereford. Uh, a guy called Jay White, who had just left the SAS, uh, a very esteemed career, and we served together in the Falklands. Uh, and indeed, he, he actually saved my femur as we assaulted down to Goose Green because we were getting mortared, and um, he just shouted out, Spud! And I sort of stopped, and then a big sort of length of shrapnel came sizzling past my right theme, femur. So John and I, Jay White and I have always had a sort of uh, been, been mates. Anyway, I bumped into him in Hereford and he said that he'd just formed a company, the, the now very famous Olive Security, uh, multi-million pound contract uh, company now, which has been bought out. He said that they'd got their first contract and that they were going to assist Sky News. Sky News had a Maverick team um, that they were going to cover the war without being embedded. And the invasion into Iraq was basically the first war where you had two sets of journalists. You had the embedded and the journalists were embedded 
with units, whether they were on board ship in the Gulf or whether they were forward with the combat marine teams. And they had unembedded, basically people like myself that had all of the uh, journalistic credentials, but we were allowed a free reign on the battlefield. Um, so that sort of had inherent risks because you weren't covered by uh, you weren't covered medically and you weren't covered communications wise. And equally, you, you could become a, um, a victim of blue on blue. So you had, to, you had to have a knowledge of battlefield. You had to have combat knowledge of where not to go, and where to go. And journalists, mostly, mainly, they want to break news. And um, generally, they will risk their life to break news. Uh, not many of them have been in war. So they re really didn't know. So Sky News uh, employed JY. And JY knew I was going out to cover the war. And um, he said, well, why don't you double up as a security? And then you can use our satcoms, their satellite comms at the time, through wire, and then you can send your copy back to whoever wanted to buy it. And I thought that was a great idea. And that's basically what we did. Um, on day one of the war, I was the first unembedded journalist to cross into Iraq from Kuwait. Uh, we, Sky News filmed the first battle of Safwan. Um, and then several days into it, uh, I was involved with probably the biggest battle of the war, uh, the Battle for Al Nazaria. And that was where the famous uh, incident happened when the American Army logistics team took a wrong turn, drove into Al Nazaria, which is really a sort of a uh, nest of vipers. Um, <clears throat> you won't want to get caught in there. These guys got caught, they got ambushed, they got, most of them got killed. I think there's about 12 or 13 got killed, but there was a woman, uh, Jessica Leach, who got injured. Anyway, um, there was a big thing about it because uh, the, the American Marines and uh, everyone else thought the, the Iraqis had raped this woman and God knows well, and there was all these rumors going around. But actually, I was the first unembedded journalist to interview the doctor who saved her, and, she gave, and he gave me a completely different story. So the book covers up to Al Nazaria, and I've written about his conversation, which is, which is, very, which is very uh, humane because of an incident that happened when he was in Kuwait, when Saddam invaded Kuwait. But I won't spoil that for the, for the readers. Um, a few more days, we, we moved forward and um, eventually went into Baghdad. Once again, the Sky News and myself became the first unembedded team to reach uh, Ferdor Square, which is where that famous statue was pulled down of Saddam Hussein. And next to it was the Palestine Hotel, which is uh, where all the world media were all congregating. And um, if you can re recall far back then, um, we had embedded journalists in the Palestine Hotel for months before the invasion. <clears throat> so um, while the Sky Boys went and did all their thing and backslapped all the rest of their fellow journalists, I was left uh, wondering what to do. And I kind of wanted to go and see this statue. It had been pulled down several hours earlier um so i went over and seen the marines and basically uh they allowed me onto the sort of plinth to see this fallen statue of saddam very famous statue at the time probably still is um then there was sort of gunshot gunshots going all over the place and the marines were engaging targets because they were getting sniped at and then from the distance i saw this old boy in the middle of the road with the head and i couldn't believe it I, and the head was missing from the statue so I guess it was the head of Sudan. So I, I went over there to see if it was, and in actual fact, it was. So I've, uh, I've expanded on that in the book as well. So a quite exciting time of being sniped at, trying to bargain for this, the head of Saddam in the middle of Baghdad, and then having to be escorted back by the uh, US Marine Corps uh, back into safety. Anyway, so that went on for about three or four days, and I got a bit bored with the whole thing. JY and the Sky team were being changed over and they had to go north to, to Crete because the rumour said that uh, Saddam was hiding out into Crete, which was his uh, hometown. So I decided to make a mad dash back and I took a few journalists back with me um, in typical sort of military style, gave them a briefing, a no-nonsense briefing, what I'm going to do, what I wanted from them, what I expected from them and stop fucking asking questions sort of thing, you know, because journalists always ask questions. Uh, so we eventually met we made it back to the border um, after 
having been given by the Marines a big piece of this arse, you know, from the statue. Because the Marine said to me, he said, well, buddy, what do you want a piece of the, the bronze? And I said, yeah, I will do. And it just happened that his left buttock came off. They cut it off with this uh, steel disc cutter and smashed it with a crowbar and stuff. Um, so I eventually had that in the back of the uh, in the back of the wagon. Got stopped by the Kuwaiti police army on the border. They didn't believe we'd come from Baghdad. Uh, they took away a lot of trinkets from the guys. The guys had pinched a lot of Saddam pictures and I mean, you know, the usual stuff. AK forty seven rounds and magazines. God knows why they wanted them. <clears throat> but they left the arse alone in the back of the truck. And I said to one of the soldiers, I said, you know, that's that's a bullet catcher. That's protect. They kind of understood that because I had sandbags in the back as well. So, so um, cut a long story short from there, the book then takes us uh, several years forward. Um, I was still working in Iraq and um, I was getting really, really pissed off with the way our wounded and soldiers were being treated. And I, the Sun ran a, a news article that really slagged off the NHS and I couldn't believe what I was hearing. So. I made some investigations. It wasn't as bad as what the sun had made out, but it, it was enough. It was concerning enough for me to sort of wanted to do something about it. So I thought, with this piece of ass, what could I do? So I decided to uh, put it up for auction to raise money for the Royal Centre Defence Medicine, which was where all our boys and girls were coming back to the wounded, and they were being sort of looked after there. And um, hope for the Warriors, which is a U.S. Marine Corps uh, charity in America which I sort of got involved in. Um, so I put it up for auction. It sort of didn't reach its reserve because I, I deliberately put a high reserve on it because when you put something in auction, you don't, you want to give it an outing, something as, uh, uh, as kind of important historically, I guess, as the arse or as funny as the arse at the time it was, it wasn't historically important then um, to give it a second outing. So I, I put a, a an unachievable high reserve just to get a feeling what the market wanted. And then, and then after that, all hell broke loose because uh, the police then sort of came and arrested me. Uh, they wanted to know where the arse was, why was I selling it? I stole it. And then they came out with the United Nations sanctions. I stole the arse, knowingly taking or stealing Iraqi cultural property. Can you believe it? So the book sort of covers that part from the Keystone Cop element of them trying to chase me and find the arse and they still haven't got it yet I was I was bailed seven times over a period of 14-15 months which really screws up your business uh, screws up everything screws up your life because you're left in limbo and I, that really pissed me off that got me angry and um, they eventually because they couldn't find it they eventually said the arse wasn't the arse and I was a fraud, which really, really pissed me off as well. So I decided to write the book about the story to see how complicit some of the police were and just how devious they were in trying to, uh, I don't know, react to some foreign government telling them what to do. I mean, basically, they were. I, I thought that, and the way contracts work in Iraq, as they do generally everywhere, you get a contract somebody wants something else you know the brown envelope type of thing so i've got this thing in my head that maybe the british government was doing something in baghdad and one of the one of the ministers iraqi ministers decided he'd want the arse he may have the head but he wanted the arse and he realized how much it was worth now um, because i've got estimates anything up from forty thousand to two hundred and fifty thousand pounds at the time um so i got the impression that uh, they screamed at the uh, British Embassy apparatchiks in Baghdad, who then screamed at the Metropolitan Police in London. And the Metropolitan Police in London were so, well, I, I know this, they were so embarrassed that they, they farmed it off to Derbyshire Police because that's where I initially auctioned the, uh, the arse up at Derby. Only because my business partner at the time knew someone that knew Charles Hansen, the, the, the chap on the BBC Antique Programme. We auctioned it at his auction house. Um, and that's when my sort of life changed, really, because um, then I, I went back to Kuwait and went to an Islamic art festival and bumped into an American guy, and he put an estimate of seven to 10 million US dollars on it. 
which absolutely shocked me. But he then he gave me the he gave me the the example of the Mona Lisa. He said the Mona Lisa you you can't buy it. I mean, if it was a billion dollars, you still wouldn't be able to buy it. It's the last estimate a few years ago was seven hundred and fifty million. And I said, why is that? He said, well. It's the provenance of it. He said, if you saw it in a yard sale or a boot fair, you wouldn't give 10 quid for it. He said, but it's the provenance behind it. He said, same with your arse. He says, it's the provenance behind the actual object. So, you know, I was being run around. Um, one time I got a message, uh, got a phone call. I don't normally, I don't normally answer phone people. When people sort of phone me up and say, hey, Spud, it's either a, a good friend uh, or possibly a journalist because it was still quite warm at the time from the auction. So I, and it was a no call, you know, no call identity on the phone. So I decided to take it anyway. And this bloke phoned up and said, uh, he said, is that Spud? I said, yeah. He says, this is a friend. I went, oh mate, not, not that old chestnut. What do you want? You know, what journalist, what newspaper? Are you an independent? Um, he said, no, he said, this is, this is a friend. This is no duff. So you know what no duff is. So, so, I mean, I thought, well, if you're saying to me no duff, that indicates to me that it means basically there's, uh, if you're on exercise, for, for your listeners and viewers, if you're on exercise and someone has a fatality or a bad injury, uh, no duff means you go on the radio and you say no duff. And basically it means that if you're the enemy, you're not allowed to use the area where the accident took place to enhance your position to then when, when, when the injured is lifted out of the area, you can then use that information to then go and attack the, the forces there. So it's no duff. So it meant, you know, don't piss about. This is, this is, this is not training. This is real life. So, so I sort of took that on board. He said, have you got the arse? And I says, well, well, yeah, I have. <laughs> and uh, I said, why? He said, because they're coming to get it. I said, what do you mean they're coming to get it? He said, the police, they're coming to uh, search your properties. I says, well, right. So they're going to do a raid on it. He said, yeah, they do, they're doing a raid on it. I said, but I'm in Herefordshire. And they said, yeah, they're coming. I said, when are they coming? And he said, well, what's the day? I said, Friday. He said, how about Monday? <laughs> so they <Yeah>. gave me. <laughs> so this is, a, this is someone up there in the security services helping me they know the cause they they know i'm not a threat for anything or a thief or this is the absurdity of it so that the book covers that side as well so that's um i enjoyed writing the book it is funny it's been re it's a reviewer put up something like um it's a corking read crisp eloquent and at times laugh out loud and it is and it made me absolutely laugh when i was writing it to the absurdity the waste of police time, taxpayers' money, the whole bloody lot. I engaged a uh, pro bono barrister, uh, and that's in the book as well. So, so the book is of two parts. The book is uh, my adventure through war to get the arse. I didn't intend to get the arse. I just intended to be first for whatever I did and break decent, decent stories, which I hope I did. And the second part is back in the UK, where uh, I'm pursued by the this mad Derbyshire constabulary and helped on by the Metropolitan Police. <laughs> They're crazy. So, Spud, what's it like then? Because the thought of the police rocking up on your doorstep would terrify your average person. Or is certain, well, not, not, not everybody, but it's going to put your nose out of it. As an SAS man that's seen combat, are you... How do you deal with that copper when you're at your door? Are you, are you nervous or are you just like, what will be, yeah. will be? Well, well, the funny thing is, because I live in quite isolation, um, I, I, I know the, the sounds. Um, and I, I, heard a, uh, I heard a pheasant sort of cry and flutter around. And I knew that wouldn't be a fox because it was daylight. And um, so I knew something had disturbed it. So... You know, I was wait obviously I was waiting for the Monday when the Monday came. I wasn't sure if they were going to turn up, but uh, I was waiting for them. Anyway, this um this pheasant fluttered around and I thought, well, okay, then someone's coming down the track. And uh, yeah, I, I was I was right. It was this guy, Sergeant, his name's Sergeant Sergeant in the book. Uh, he was promoted to inspector after all this 
nonsense. But uh, yes, sorry, Sergeant Sergeant came knocking at the door. And uh, I said to him, yeah, what do you want? He says, oh, we've got a search warrant to come and search. I said, what, what, do, you, what do you want to search for? He says, I've come to search for the, the bronze arse of Saddam. I said, all right, then. I said, where's the search warrant? He says, uh, oh, it's in the car up the track. We got stuck up the track. I said, uh, I guess it's an unmade road where I live. I said, well, you better go and get it then. So he trudged all the way back up there and he came down with two heavies. And actually, in fact, the two heavies turned out to be real nice. You know, they came in the cottage and uh, uh, asked them to take their boots off if they wanted to go upstairs. They spent a couple of hours here, uh, took away my diaries because I, I wrote a diary every day of the campaign, um, which I needed, to, obviously, notes to write the book. And they were, they were really good. But the strange thing was, and this really, really worried me, um, they didn't ask me. I've got a firearms license and a shotgun license, yeah? And I have weapons. And um, they didn't ask me if they could see them. I had to physically tell them and show them. I had to say, look, you know, I've got weapons in the house here, guns. And they went, oh, right, really? And you would have thought that's the first thing they would have done, especially in this day and age. So I said, look, you need to come to the gun cabinet and we'll sort it out and I'll, I'll be nice and slow and take it easy so you know what you know. obviously they weren't uh, trained in, in 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 weapons so I was very I was very cautious because I didn't want anything to uh, to happen and yeah that that completely blew me that completely blew me they, they didn't even know I had firearms licenses so uh, just shows you the inadequacies or anyway they they, they left with, with tails between their legs I guess it was a jolly for them from from Derby, and uh, yeah, that's when the, that's when it all started. That was when the fun and game started. But uh, it just showed showed me the incompetence of the police up there. I'm sure they're not all like that, but certainly Derbyshire and Sabri were. Are you at liberty to tell us what what weapons you've got? I'm quite interested. Yeah, I'll, I'll rather not. I'll tell you. I'll tell you off offline. Okay. Yeah, I'll tell you what, yeah. that's, um, oh, hey, that's one of these instructions. Policeman, everything's legal. I get seven to ten years if I didn't. Yeah, of course. Easy. Yeah, I've got a friend, he's got a few rifles and stuff, and he's he does a lot of work for farmers and kind of lap lords that have got big areas of land and taking out foxes and... and yeah, yeah, yeah. And, We've got um, a big squirrels here, around here at the moment. Yeah. Literally squirrels. First time I've seen it in years. And they're taking all, first time I've seen it, they've ta they're taking all the conkers off the tree, which is unheard of. I've never, I would have thought they'd be poisonous or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, they've been taking them and burying them, bless them. Maybe a hard winter's coming. Yeah, for, for all of us, I think, if this nonsense uh, carries on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And you've got some other stories um, from Iraq. You've had some close shaves over there. Yeah. When I when we initially crossed the border, I had this jeep, the sheikh who I dealt business with, the sheikh Hamoud al-Sabah in Kuwait. He gave me one of his vehicles and it was one of these jeeps, Jeep Cherokee it was. Uh, but JY and the Sky Team had these Hiluxes. And uh, what you should have done as... as uh, a journalist, and we did, was put the um, the arrow, the black arrow, on the side of the vehicle and on the roof, which which was to tell those guys up in the air, don't hit us, we're friendly forces, you know, a big black arrow. But JY and I decided that wasn't good enough. <laughs> you know what I mean? In the heat of combat, that's not fucking good enough. So I got a Stars and Stripes flag, managed to find one in Kuwait City, and JY got the, got the Union flag, and we, we taped them to the roofs of our vehicles. So we but the first time we crossed the border was away from the uh, the main crossing point at Abdili, which was where all the main, the British and the Americans were, were going to go through. We crossed it further up from Safwan towards, uh, towards the coast, an area which I knew very well from my time in Kuwait. And... Uh, as soon as we crossed it, we, we, were, we were intercepted by these three Cobra gunships, and that was absolutely scary. The Cobra gunship is the, the U.S. Marine equivalent of our Apache, and uh, that was absolutely frightening. The lead, the lead pilot came down to about 300, 400 metres, dipped its nose, and I thought we were just going to get vaporised. It was absolutely fucking mind-blowing. 
And the thing you do in vehicles is you never, never, never get out of the vehicle. Even if your vehicle is uh, disappearing from the, you know, just it's all smashed up and it's disappearing from where, where you're sitting. You don't even get out the vehicle unless, unless you really have to. And then you make a dash for it. Uh, this incident, I was screaming to the teams, don't get out the vehicle. JY was doing the same. Um, and then eventually I had to do something because he came right down, dropped his nose. And I thought, what's he going to do? He's not going to waste a hellfire on us. He's going to, he's going to spray us with his 20 mil volt and cannons. So I basically put my, you know, head and arms and hands out the window like like I'm surrendering and eventually managed to get to, and I'm screaming at him, you know, we're Brits, we're friendly, you know what you do when you're like really pissed off and you, you're just about, to, just about to die. And um, I got out the car, then Jay White, we slid out the cars, the vans, and um, he sort of saw that we were Brits, saw, obviously saw the Union Jet, the, 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 the Jack, uh, the Union flag and the Stars and Stripes on our vehicles and realised we weren't a threat. But it was, you know, several minutes of heart beating. You know, this is it. We haven't even got, we've only crossed the, you know, 100 metres into the desert, into Iraq, and this is us. This is us. Goodbye. But he saw sense, thank God. Uh, he did a, a smart left and uh, turned off towards Amkusur Port. Um, and then we managed to hitch up with the uh, the convoy guy north, which was the basically we we wanted to cover the Brits down in Basra, but really the Brits wasn't the story for me. Sky News wanted to cover it because their anchor man um, Jeremy Thompson was covering with the Irish was was down there embedded with the Royal Irish, and uh, but I wanted to get the Baghdad because that's what the story was. Uh, but I had to go with the Sky team for safety. Uh, we got several miles outside of. Um, Basra, where we got to stop by the Brits. I thought, well, we're going to get captured here and sent back across the border. But they basically told us you can't go any further because there's T-74, T-72 tanks down the road and we're just about to engage them. So that was that was like, oh, OK, then we'll, we'll do a left and we'll jump on the back of the Marines. Thank you. <laughs> and that's what we did. Um, unfortunately, several hours later, <clears throat> ITN, uh, journalist, ITV journalist Terry Lloyd, who I'd had a coffee with in the Marriott Hotel in Kuwait several days earlier, real nice chap, went down with his camera crew and got killed in a blue on blue American airstrike. Um, I don't think they've, I don't think they found the uh, the French cameraman either. I think he's still missing, presumed dead. Yeah, so that's. Uh... Yeah, I think I remember. you remember that. Bring me the arse of Saddam. Can you see that? Yes, we can. Love your picture of me on the back as well. <laughs> and we're gonna we'll put a link for it below the below this video, folks. So please yeah. get your, follow the link and get yourselves a copy. So what was it like writing the book? You say you wrote it off the back of this police harassment. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Yeah, it angered me so much that I thought, although my Although having my experience of being bailed several several times during that period, it's not uncommon. People get bailed like that all the frigging time. I mean, they get bailed seven, eight times in a year. And, you know, for me living in Herefordshire, I had to go to um, Derby every time, two and a half hour, three hour drive back. You know, it's all time and it's designed to grind you down. Um, and I had to let them know if I was uh, going off out the country. I mean, it really is. It, it really is. It's, they treat you like a they treat you like a terrorist, you know. They don't like veterans either, do they? So I mean, but that's another that's another opinion that I have. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I I I decided to write the book. I went to my agent, and um, he sort of he did he t he turned it down. He, he he that's what he did. He turned it down. But he's also turned down a couple of other books of which have been bestsellers. So, uh, but he's a good guy. Uh, he's a good guy. He just has so much on. Um, so I said, okay, then you don't want it. Um, I'll write it myself. And at the time, a couple of years back, Amazon were making self-publishing the way to go forward for people that haven't ever been published. Now, I've, I've been published several times before by a big publisher. So 
I was going to take it to them, but I thought, no, I'll, um, it's because it's a niche genre. Uh, when I say that, it's, although it's a sort of SAS and para, and there's a bit of war in it, it's also sort of comical in the sense of the second part of the book is a bit of a farce or a Keystone Cop farce. And I thought, well, I'll have a go at it. If it's, if, it, if it's that good, you know, it'll sell. And I, I write to make money. I don't write because I want to see my name on the front jacket. I, I, I write to make money because it's, as you know, Chris, it is, it is very hard and it's tedious and you have to become very, very disciplined in order to finish the book. So I decided to do it myself. I, I watched, a ton of YouTube videos, and there's some great videos out there on how how to do it with Amazon, uh, which which was the path I was going to take and did take eventually. Um, how to set it up, the text, the font to use, everything out is out there on YouTube. Um, also, get a book off the shelf if you're un, unsure. Measure the margins. It's normally 35 lines per page and 10 words per page. You know, so you get an idea because. If you can't get an agent, and I, I would always say try and get an agent, but getting an agent these days is, unless you're someone very well known uh, or you're very, 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 very lucky to send your manuscript in on a Monday morning, they pick it up and they've just seen a war movie, for example, and your, your manuscript's about war and they like it and it's a bloke or a woman, um, it go with file 13. Uh, so you, you, the options are very, very... Uh, tiny for, for self-publishing authors, first-time authors. Um, so that's what you do. Um, I went through Amazon. Amazon are very good. Get yourself an Amazon account. Um, they take you stage, stage by stage in actually setting up the book. Write the book. Your book should be between, well, a non-fiction book, because that's all I write, is generally between 70 and 120,000. You know, my uncensored Voices for Goose Green, the Goose Green book is about 130, but it's quite a it's quite a big book. But generally, 80,000 is quite good. Um, yeah, you you set it up with the font that you prefer. Uh, normally, it's uh, Times or uh, uh, one of the Arial's not a good one. Um, Garamond is good. Uh, the other one's Courier. They, a lot of them like Courier. So. But you can choose whatever font you want. All the all the bump, all the blurb in the front of it, all these books, you can get online through the YouTube videos or copy it from a, a recent book. And that's what you do with that. Uh, when you've got it all um, all up together, you have to have it edited. Now, this is this is what happened to me when I first uh, published "Bring Me the Arts of Saddam." Uh, my my brother was dying of cancer, and. Um, he didn't have long to live, and I kind of rushed it because I wanted him to feel the book when he was lying on his deathbed. You know, it was a personal thing for me. By trying to reach that um, timeline, I didn't have it edited properly. I paid to have it edited, and that's another thing. You have to be careful who edits it. I paid about 500 quid to have it edited, um, and they didn't edit it right, but I thought they'd done a job. But I did re-edit it myself, if you understand. It was it was sent to a company that does it, that does editing, so they say. Uh, but they don't know the idiosyncrasies of this particular genre, i.e., military. You be, always best if you're writing a book about you know war or military, try and find a, a military editor. Um, yeah. So they didn't edit it right, so it went to print. My brother uh, saw a bit of the book. Uh, I, I rushed it out, went to print, and there was an awful lot of mistakes in it embarrassing it a load embarrassing uh, and i and i and i want to make an apology to everybody that bought the first edition um although it still reads right there was the grammatical uh mistakes in it spelling mistakes um yeah it, I, I wasn't proud of the first edition <laughs> but uh, that's all corrected now so the things you need you need to write the book you need to get it edited then you have to pay someone to design the jacket because jackets are like fashion okay uh at the time amazon only did paperback uh they now do hardback but it's what they call a wraparound hardback uh they don't have a dust jacket on them so a wraparound is like remember the uh, uh the, the the school the comic annuals remember the hardcover annuals the beanos yes. 
how I remember it. It's the wraparound jacket. It doesn't have the paper jacket. It's, it's basically stuck on. So um, you have to have a jacket designer, someone specifically that's, that knows how to set the, set the jacket up and knows the fashion of, of books for your genre. Um, I was, I tried three and I was embarrassed. And then I tried a fourth off the internet, a guy called John Amy, who really did a good job. And he, he's, uh, his credit is in the front of the book. So if you wanted to get hold of him, buy the book and you'll see the credit in there for him. And he did a great job. It's the second jacket he's done because I've upgraded the book to, to uh, um, you know, you have to refresh the book all the time. Uh, see, so my advice is get an editor, pay for an editor, pay for a jacket designer. But having said that, a friend of mine wrote a small book about uh, uh, war poems. And he got a chap in Singapore, I think, paid $40 for the jacket design. But I paid about £200 for mine because there's complications uh, in it. You know, it's more, it's, it's, well, you look at the jacket, you see the back of the book as well. There's a lot more detail to it. So you have to pay for that. Um, yeah, so the jacket design, once you've got the jacket template, um, you then upload it all to Amazon and they do it. And they check to see if you're, text is in line with their book um, they give you several different book sizes you choose from my book bring me the answer sedan is nine by six which is a common kind of it's a nice size you can see it it's not as big as a it's not as big as a hardback and it's not as small as a traditional paperback novel um, they put it all in and they actually go through it page by page very quickly with this modern technology and they tell you if your text is outside the lines of their perimeters, you know, and they tell you to, um, you know, adjust it. What I will say is you can upload it in Word, but you should really do it in Adobe because they like Adobe. Now, that may have changed. I haven't uploaded a book for a couple of years, um, but that, well, that's wrong six months ago. Um, so look at the software that suits you and you have to buy Adobe or at least buy, I think it's £12 a month, work out how you're going to set up the book and, and do it. That Writing the book is the easy thing. It is the easy thing about being an author, is writing a book. Um, getting it published through Amazon is relatively easy. It's not... You know, if you're... If, you're, uh, if you know your way around word processing... And incidentally, a friend of mine, I spoke to him yesterday, Lonnie, he's like an expert in IT and all that. And he's written this book. He sent it to me. He said he, said he wants me to read through it um, because this is first time publisher. And I said to him, Lonnie, if you know your way around the IT, the, the word processing business and software, he said, I do. I said, well, you're fine. Okay. But it's not necessary. I did. I had to learn everything myself. The process was, was, you know, I had to learn it all myself. So once you've, once you've done that, uh, you've got it to Amazon, and then they send you a, a uh, uh, basically a draft copy format. You have to pay for that. It's only about five, six quid, and it comes with drafts stamped all over it, so you can't sell it. Um, you like the idea. Then you have to get an ISBN number. Now, Amazon... The ISBN number is, is the international number that tells you. It's basically the fingerprint of the book anywhere in the world. Now, Amazon give, you, give them for free. But funny, contemptuously, in my opinion, booksellers don't like the Amazon ISBN number. Okay, so you have to buy the ISBN number. I think... I bought six ISBN numbers for about 130 quid off a company. There's only two or three companies that sell them off a company called Nielsen, I think. Um, I bought six because I thought uh, it was cheaper in the long run rather than I think it was about 50, 60 quid for one. Yeah. So I, bought, I bought five or six. So you have to have that. And that's when you go through the Amazon process, there's a little space on the back of the, the book that you put it in. You know, and the software designs and does it all for you. So that's fine. Um, yeah, when the book comes back, you read through it again, look at the quality, make any changes, uh, put it into Amazon, make the changes, it gets accepted. 
they then put it up on their website. You're ready to rock and roll. That is the easy bit. The hardest bit is marketing, as I found out. It's marketing. You could have the best book in the world, fantastic book. If you can't get it out to people, you ain't going to sell any. You ain't going to sell any copies. So you have to, this, there's two ways of, of getting the book out. One is through Amazon. The other one is through a company called Ingram Spark. What's well, Ingram now? Um, basically, they are a company which booksellers, retail booksellers, buy from. Yeah. You then go through the same process as you went through Amazon. Slightly different, but it's, it, you have to pay for it. Okay, it's slightly different. Um, and this, see, I've got the Amazon book here, which is a bit flimsy, but thick. And I've got the Ingram Spark book, which is a bit more quality, but it's thinner, slightly different uh, font style, but the same font, but slightly different style. Um, but they are both the same. And you need, if you want to get your book out, which I'm sure you do, you need to make sales, then you have to do Ingram Spark as well. Um, so they're the two ways of going out. Amazon, across the world platform, um, and Ingram Spark, which uh, retailers buy from in bulk. We lost our one, Bet Betrams, I think, Bertrams. They were like a mini Ingram Spark. They went bust, I think, last year during the CCP virus. So I, was, I would look at Ingram Spark, but initially go for Amazon, because Amazon will then convert your book to Kindle. Um, and Kindle sales are really good. They're up 15% year, year on year. Um, so you've got your book out. It's been, it's, you go through the process of, you have to, uh, um, you, you have to look at what you, books like your sell, and then you price accordingly. Um, a lot of people give free books away. I don't like the idea of that because free books I mean, all that hard work that you put in as an author and all that time, you shouldn't be giving it away for free. And it also tells me it's not worth buying <laughs> if you give it away for free. Um, you can do <coughs> you can reduce sales, reduce price, which is fine. Um, so then, OK, so then you, you've got it out there. But as I say, Amazon takes you through all the steps through uh, pricing, uh, different territories. When I talk about territories, I talk about countries, America you know, Canada, all, all the uh, Western countries. And in particular, Germany is a big, is a very big buyer of um, English books, written books. So, you know, um, but it's a worldwide territory and you get different commissions. So you've, you've got your book out and you're making no sales. There's two ways that I advertise. Well, there was two ways. One was through Amazon. They stopped me advertising because profanity. My book title is "Bring Me the Ass of Saddam," so I don't come, I don't come within their code of practice for advertising. So I can't advertise on Amazon. I can sell my book on Amazon. They freely allow me to sell my book on Amazon, but they will not allow me to advertise. So all my advertising is through Facebook. Um, and once again, you have to have a Facebook account, an advertising account. It's for a, for a single product. Like a book, it's very easy to do. Um, I'm no expert in it, and I'm no expert in the matrix and the, me the metrics and the data that, that Facebook give you. They give you an enormous amount of uh, data. Uh, but um, I only look at cost, cost per click and sales and stuff like that. So, uh, And because I've only got one product, and that's the arse book, I, I advertise because all my other books are through mainstream publishers. Um, I've only got that to worry about. Um, and that's kind of really, that works for me. I, if you spend a hundred pound in advertising, and once again, you have to go on YouTube to listen to all these guys and girls with great experience. And they, you know, you really glean some fantastic information out of it. If I spend a hundred pounds and I return like 130, that's good for me. You know, it's a thousand, you know, you are 1300. Um, but even if I spend a hundred pounds and make 101, that's, that's all right, because basically what you're doing is you're getting your book out. Mm. People are looking at it. They're making people aware of it. Um, if you spend £100, obviously, and you get 80 quid back, well, you need to change the advert. <laughs> you know, you need to look at the sort of metrics within the Facebook uh, advertising uh, module that, they, that, you, that you go for, you know. So um, 
yeah, I, I mean, I, it became, um, the arse became a bestseller purely through advertising. It was no, it was all my hard work, um, all my all my effort, and thank you to the people on Facebook with their videos as well, because they helped me as, you know, they helped me enormously. I wouldn't have been able to do it without that, because in the old days, you had to go to people that had the experience. But now, you know, there's loads of us out there that have got this experience. Um, I I looked at the book and I felt marvellous. And it, it got to number one in certain genres. On Amazon, there's different genres of books. Um, for example, humour, Navy, army, uh, you know, murder, true crime, stuff like that. It got, and I like this because you're a Marine, Royal Marine, um, it, got, uh, it got to number one in the Navy on Kindle. And it beat that Ant Middleton. And Ant Middleton's got a massive publisher. I think he's Trans World, is it, or something like that. So I was really, really pleased with that. Uh, and it stayed in the top 10 for, you know, f several weeks. And hopefully, I'm going to boost it up again. Um, <laughs> so it is hard work. You've got to get on it. You've got to, you've got to do at least an hour a day with it, um, if you can. And you've got to be prepared to spend some money. The whole process, from start to finish, forget your time. Time is your time's nothing. Um, you shouldn't. Uh, you wouldn't want to sort of uh, value that. Um, the whole thing, if physical money that it's cost me, has been about two thousand eight hundred pounds, um, of which I've clawed that back, and my sales, even without advertising. And I'll be perfectly frank with your viewers and listeners, Chris. Um, without advertising, my sales bump along at about 30, 40 a month, you know, without advertising. When I start throwing money at it, obviously it goes up. It's like Nike. They spend millions and millions of pounds a month worldwide, tens of millions to sell their kit. And you have to, you have to keep it there in, up in front of the people. Um, Facebook allows you not to send it to all your mates all the time because they get pissed off with it. So it allows you to send it to a certain sort of audience like your mates, like your friends. Um, so do you, you, do you write a Facebook post and obviously have your book cover in it? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have a link directly to Amazon. Is, is that, and then you just click the button underneath that says promote this post? Yeah, it says, I think I've got a button called buy now. The, the advert I'm running at the moment is by now. So, on, yeah, you're right, Chris. On the Amazon, on the Facebook advert, you have a little button. Um, and it says buy now. And you click on that button and it sends you to your link in Amazon. Um, and you can buy it in Kindle, paperback. I'm looking at the hardback. But like I said previous, the, the hardback from Amazon, which is a new thing. It's only been out a couple of months. It's a wraparound hardback. So I'm going to, this week, I'm going to sort out a hardback, um, go through the process, get a draft copy of it, and see if it's acceptable in my eyes for the extra money um, and the profitability for myself, of course, um, to see if people, if it's acceptable, I think, for my, for my readers. Uh, I have put it out online, my Facebook and online, and uh, people say, yeah, yeah, I'd like a signed copy and a hardback. Christmas coming up. Christmas is a very, very difficult time to, to break into for book sales. Everybody's competing. The big publishers are competing. But I'll, I'll have a go and I'll sort it out this week. The other thing I've got um, is the audiobook. I learned all about how to do an audiobook. I did that during lockdown last year. And um, I can talk you through that if you want chris or... yeah I'm, I'm fascinated it's something i'm it's something i've got to do so i'd be interested to hear yeah the, uh, idiosyncrasies of it well the audio book <laughs> um mine is seven hours 30 minutes no it's seven hours 29 minutes 13 seconds long okay once again it's through amazon Fantastic setup they have uh, through their audio book company. It's called a AZT or something like that. You can find it out there online. Link to Amazon. Um, 
there are two ways of going. There are ways of, there, there are three ways with an audio book, actually. One, you can narrate it. You can narrate people's audio books. Two, you can narrate it yourself. Or three, you get somebody else to narrate your book. I am the narrator of my book. Um, for no other reason, I just wanted the experience of seeing if I can, if my voice is, you know, pleasant enough, if it's suitable enough um, for an audio book. So I went that way. Um, once again, the software from Amazon to set it all up is simple. It really is simple. What you then have to do is the most important thing with an audio book is the mic. It's no good having one of these 80 quid mics that maybe bloggers use, podcasters use. You need a very sensitive mic. You need a very quiet area. You need to soundproof. Uh, I'm quite lucky because I live in the middle of nowhere. And the only thing I had to edit out was the bloody birds noises, honestly, because they're quite piercing. And I had the curtains closed and I, all soundproofing. But every now and again, you'd go through and go, you hear this bird sweep and you have to cut it out, editing it out. And, uh, um, but yeah, so if you feel that you can talk and read correctly and, and, and read, uh, if you feel competent enough to do it, I would suggest go and do it. Uh, Read 20 minutes, record yourself reading 20 minutes, and then play it back. So you read for 20 minutes to know that you know the narrative. Um, don't try and do accents. Accentuate the accents. I can't do accents, so that's easy for me. But you can accentuate a jock accent or a Brummie accent. But unless you can do accents really good, stay away from that. That's what they say, and it works. Yeah, read for 20 minutes so you know the narrative. Record it for 20 minutes and then play it back. So I, I did it in 20 minute blocks. Um, there is a software out there called Audacity, which is free. Absolutely brilliant. Loads of people have done stuff on YouTube about it. That's what I used. So you need a decent mic, condensing mic. I use a, I'm not, I'm not getting paid for this advertising, a Rode SM6 Rode mic. Um, it's about 250 quid's worth, all right? And you need one of these proper screens for your pop, 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 pop. Because the, the, the hardest thing I found out about, um, which I thought would be the easiest, the hardest is editing. I thought I would be pretty poor at reading and getting my point across of the story. But no, it's the, it's the editing. For 20 minutes, for me, 20 minutes of, of reading, narrating, recording equated to about two hours of editing you know i mean it's but you do get used to it you do get used to it and audacity is very easy program to learn from so you need the mic you need a proper mic you need audacity you need a software program there are there are programs out there but so, software programs can be expensive they're mainly designed for musicians and stuff like that i didn't need too many tweaks and audacity was the one that sort of i liked the interface of it all and everything and of course the other thing is you need you need an interface you need an audio interface which i've got that's about a hundred quid basically it it transforms the sound from the mic through into your computer into the software and it sorts it all out and you've got a couple of little you've seen them haven't you the roadies do they turn and tweak the and you can tweak it with this uh, uh, audio interface um, the whole package is about 300 quid, 350 quid. So you're 350 quid light even before you start. And once again, like writing, forget your time. Your time's nothing. Time's worthless. <laughs> um, once you've done it, I do a chapter at a time. They expect oh, um, Amazon tell you to do a chapter at a time. First of all, you record the front book as one file you just say bring me the answer of saddam uh by nigel ely written narrated by nigel ely that's one file the second file would be the acknowledgements if you wanted to put them in the introduction then chapter one two three four they're all separate files okay so you upload in, in my case about 30 odd files and the last file and i'm just telling you this out of uh because it, it's, it's interesting the last file is the end that's all you say 
All right. <laughs> so it's, it is, it, it, I don't know, it's probably for the uh, technicians in all, uh, Amazon to sort of follow it through. Um, and they structure it, they put the price on, uh, they pitch it where they think it's going to be right. Um, once again, you have to have a, you have to spend money on advertising, but you can combine that because if somebody goes to your Amazon page to look at the book or the Kindle, they're going to see the audio there as well. And you can, as you can with the with the Kindle and the uh, the written word, uh, the book, you can get the audio sample. And that that's my audio sample is uh, uh, a bastardized, I think, two minute part of narrative that I that I took from the book. Yeah. And that 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 whole look took me three months. Is your road road mic? I'm guessing that's not a USB mic then. Is that the, the regular? Yes, condensing mic. Can you see that? Yeah, what's the connection on it that actually you plug in? Is it is it got it? I can't remember the um yeah it's a it's a din it's a din plug din socket three pin three din Ah, okay. I'm thinking um, it goes into the uh, audio interface. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. That's the one that I meant. Yeah, and it's okay. a long. It's sometimes you're you're remoted from the f interface um, from the mic, aren't you? If you know, if you want it on a stand or something like that. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a it's a good mic. It's highly recommended. But there are loads of other mics out there. But at the time. I've got this as a good price, and um, I'm not a technophile. I mean, I'm not technically minded at all. I mean, I, um, I'm self-taught. Mm. I don't read instructions. So I'm the sort of guy that takes it out of the box, puts it all together, find, find I've fucked it up a bit, and then have to read the instructions again. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the way it is. Um, and, of course, the other thing is um, you need – you need a mic holder and I've got one of these extendable you know like those uh, lamp desk lamps yeah you go this sort of thing yeah um, this is um this is a cheap and cheerful I say cheap and cheerful that that there is about 200 quids worth um oh. it's it's just the yeti blue that a lot of podcasters yeah. use so you'd and know you have to have a, a proper um what do they call it sort of cantilever type mic holder yeah, but I've also got um, Shure microphones. So that's your Joe Rogan podcast microphones or your Michael Jackson recorded one of his albums on them. They're the, the sort of best you can get. Um, but that's got that connector that you just showed. So I'd have to get that somehow. Um, it, does, it does have a, a stereo output jack, just, just like your, your headphones have. Yeah. I'm hoping I can, or rather my, um, uh, it's called a Zoom box. It's, it's your, it's, uh, it's like your gubbins, but you also, with those microphones, you need an, a booster box because they need an electronic, uh, they need 24 volts going through them to work. Not, not like this microphone. Yeah, that's what um, this is. This is the audio interface. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, and unlike your Yeti, although they 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 recommend them for podcasts, when you do an audio book, you need a, this a more particular mic. And you when you when you read, when you start reading, you have to be about four or five inches. Okay, because an audio book is so sensitive with the, the, the sound. The vo you know the sound that picks up everything and uh, the expression in one's voice, which creates that element within within the narrative. Um, but you need one of these pop up. I didn't put it on today, but uh, one of these yeah sort of goes there, and that stops once again, like I've said previous. Put, 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 you know, and it's all to do with uh, cutting down on editing. As I said, the editing is the the longest part of it. And Audacity is, is such a simple software. If you screwed up your lines, you can actually, as long as you've got the same settings in the same room and the same sort of sound settings, you can actually chop it out of, out of your recording, re-record it, and put it back in. Mm. 
done that a couple of times. Unless you're really, really finicky, you don't notice a difference. And, and also when people, and that's such a pain in the ass for me, when I listen to audiobooks done by professional narrators, they, they, they speak so slowly. Um, so I was aware of the criticism on that when I recorded, you know, Bring Me the Ass of Saddam, because I kind of talk quite fast. So that suited me. So when I, you know, when it became seven hours and 30 minutes, I thought well, that's quite short. And it's a standard, if not a slightly longer book, as opposed to nine hours. So I cut not two hours off the book. And big people normally, some people normally, listen to audio books at one and a half times the speed. And I didn't want to be one of those narrators that, that purchasers, fans, readers, listeners wanted to, I didn't want them to listen to it at one and a half speed because it, it, it sounds crazy. So that's why I, I recorded it. I didn't slow down as the experts say you should. Now, yeah. I don't know if that works. I listened to it a couple of times, not the whole book for Christ's sakes, that'd kill me. <laughs> <laughs> you listen to yourself speaking like you, Chris. I mean, you think, oh, for Christ's sake, shut the frig up. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's been received well. Good. It's been received well. And, um, you know, anybody, any of your listeners, watchers that want, want a bit of advice, um, you, you know, uh, get on, make a comment, I suppose, and see, and I'll try and get a hold of you. But, Lonnie, if you're listening, mate, um, give us a thumbs up on this uh on this video and uh, i'll get onto your book i'll read your try and read your book this week give you some notes on it this lonnie's the type of chap that he he wants um he's written a book and i've read the first page and i'll tell you what it's uh, it, i'm going to enjoy it um but he needs the technical side he wants to self-publish himself so I, i'll help him with that i mean yes. i'm no way at all, but the uh, uh, possibilities are endless now aren't they and uh yeah Yes, I remember Aunt, Aunt Middleton asked me how to how how do you write a book. <laughs> so he's gone on to write, um, gosh, two or three bestsellers now, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah. I you know, good luck to him. I mean, I I couldn't do a book a year. Jesus, I mean, that's hard going. I They've mean, got I good support teams, haven't they? And they can afford it and. This kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They got I, I get it, mate. I get it. It takes me a solid year full time. That, so that's anything up to 18 hour days. Sometimes sometimes I'd write for 36 hours just sat in this chair. It still takes me a year to get a book. Uh, you um, know, it, it used to annoy me. It doesn't so much now. It's a business. I mean, I said to you earlier, I write to make money. Um, that's It's part of what I do. Um, I kind of enjoy it in a, in a sort of strange way. Um, but a lot of these guys that come from our backgrounds, that, like you said, they have a team around them. Uh, they're a brand. And that's the way it is. Uh, they're, they're a brand. Uh, um, and they've made an awful lot of money doing it. And that's it. Good luck to them. That's what I say. But yeah. one, has to, I was, one has to look at one in the mirror and go, you know, because I kind of like to achieve everything from start to finish, and I've done that. I haven't been anywhere as successful as a lot of those guys, but um, but I kind of done it my own my own way. And you yeah, know, I think, I think I've think i had two best, best you know, I mean, um, and it's one was through a mainstream publisher, the other one was through my hard graft. Um, so I'm evidence that it can be achieved massively. And the success is is getting the book finished and getting it out. That's 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 all the success in the world you need. It doesn't matter how many people read. If one person reads it and loves it, that your job's done, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It would be nice that uh, a million people read it. <laughs> yes, Spud. If, before you go, and obviously on behalf of the podcast, we wish you all the best of luck with "Bring Me the Ass of Sedan." Thank but you. Can you explain the? Uh, is that a misappropriation, that road sign behind you? What we call oh. in the Marines, Proft, the, the goose green sign. Oh, yeah, that was uh, 
that was given to me by my late brother as, as he was in a junk shop down in uh, East Sussex somewhere. Oh, my gosh. He gave that to me, yeah. What a great uh, souvenir to have. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, those old sort of, um, it's wooden sign, wooden sign, originals, wooden sign. Do you think, do you think a squaddy prof that then when they were down south? No, it, it um, no, it's a British. I mean, oh, I mean, it's, I'm, a, it's a place in the UK, is it? Yeah, there's a there's a place called Goose Green, actually not far from the old para barracks. You know, several miles in Sussex or somewhere like that. I think that's where it's from. I mean, it says narrow road as well. Goose Green, quarter of a mile narrow road. Uh, there was a narrow road in Goose Green. <laughs> it was a you know i don't think there was a sign up there because you could see goose green from um you know from a mile away all over so i didn't think anybody needed especially down there they, everybody knew where goose green was at the time i mean not i mean i'm talking about civilians no that, that that's come from the uk sussex somewhere there was an yeah. argentine commander um there was a bit of friction between him and the british after the war, I, I can't remember the ins and outs of it, but to highlight his kind of misunderstanding of the battle, um, someone had brought the name of the book he wrote into question, and mm. he wrote um, the name of his book was The Goose Green. You know, they put the in oh. Latin, Latin, you put the the um, adjective before after the the noun don't you so yeah. um but the green was ver verdi as in the color okay so he was saying it's a goose that's green not not it's ah, okay. it's, yeah. it's a green as in like a, a plateau or whatever you know as in a yeah. like a bowl, bowling green yes yes um yes oh that's quite funny yeah i haven't heard that book i haven't heard there's been a few out from the arges um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not uh, when I did uh, Goose Green Uncensored Voices, that 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 brought it all home to me and just tells you that as a young Tom, young paratrooper, you know, there's a there's an there's an army behind supporting you, and that's what I like about this book, the, the new book, Uncensored Voices. It's it is uncensored, it they I recorded all of them. Um, I did over a hundred and well, I'll tell you when it comes out but there was over 130 recordings i did up and down the country couldn't use them all of course um but uh, it just opened my eye with the amount of support we got and there's some lovely little funny vignettes about the marines beautiful ones about the marines chris i'm dying to tell you about them but we'll we'll talk about that hopefully uh yeah. in march and they're nice. Don't well, get me why wrong. do I immediately just have a vision of naked men? <laughs> no. In um, dress, or in dresses. No, in dresses, yeah. No, they are nice. Uh, they're not slagging off uh, stories or tales. They are, they are, they're very nice between two very professional units. Yes. Here, yeah. here. Yeah. Well, Spud, all the best of it. Stay on the line. So, obviously, I can thank you properly cool. but we'll put all links to the book folks below grab yourselves a copy yeah. of you, all of you have co covers turn it the other way <laughs> yeah we're gonna we'll we'll put um we'll put that in our thumbnail spud yeah i mean i can send you the uh yeah Definitely. you did it yeah sorry you're gonna say something yeah, you did it. Uh, didn't you? Didn't you put a um, a file up last time when we? Yeah, when we, we used we used that cover, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, we'll do something similar. Yeah, definitely. Brilliant. Yes, thanks again, mate. Well, um, I hope hope your listeners and viewers enjoyed it. Um, I do rattle on a bit, but uh, I'm quite passionate about it all. And I, uh, you know, been 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 self published for this. You know, I'd like to take all, all my knowledge through and I, I, I don't mind imparting it to anybody else, you know, gratis, because uh, I had to learn it. And uh, like yeah, everything. There's, there's two things everybody should do in life. One is run a marathon mm. or wheel a marathon, whatever your situation you're in. The, the other is write a book. 
Write yeah, anything, right. make it up. Just everyone's yeah, yeah. got a book in them. It's just a great achievement. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of demand for these hundred page books as well. These small little tales. I thought about having a go at that. Yeah, you know, the, write a book. Attention, some, attention spans are getting smaller, aren't they? And exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And to our friends at home, big love to you all. Look out yourselves if you can like and subscribe. Hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>